Well, hello, my friends. Uh, this is Todd Flowerday. I serve at the Catholic Church of St. Catherine Drexel in Ramsey, Minnesota. And you are watching or listening to a special edition of Cake Podcast. And today we have with us uh, Randy Bauer, who is a deacon. And we thought that it would be interesting to hear some of his story and how deacons become deacons. And uh, just uh, giving people a little bit more information about that very mysterious yet public role in the church. So, Randy, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, I've been uh, a deacon since September of 1993. I was ordained for the Diocese of Crookston. I was living in Detroit Lakes at the time that uh, I was ordained and uh, served in the parish in Detroit Lakes and actually uh, ended up at one point being assigned to four different parishes uh, working on all four of those, and uh, served there until 2005 when we moved to Ramsey and uh, was immediately assigned to the Church of St. Catherine Drexel. When I met with, at that time, Auxiliary uh, Bishop Pates um, and told him we'd be living somewhere in the Anoka area because that's where my wife was going to be working, uh, he said, well, we have a new parish in Ramsey, St. Catherine Drexel. Uh, would you be interested in being part of that? And I said, I would absolutely love to be part of a new parish. Uh, so he decided that once we moved here, uh, this would be the parish that I was assigned to. So I came here in August of uh, 2005. So I've been here now um, a little over 16 years. The, so you mentioned duties. Uh, what does a deacon do? whatever God calls a deacon to do. <laughs> Basically, the diaconate is a ministry of service. And you see us most frequently at the altar, because uh, we are also a minister of liturgy. Um, the gospel is always to be read by a deacon, even if the pope is present. It's still a deacon if a deacon is there that proclaims the gospel. Um, but we assist the priest during the um, uh, celebration of, of the Mass. Um, there's other liturgies that we can uh, participate with. So, for example, when Father Paul is not available, I'll do a, a service of word and communion, um, which very clearly is not a Mass. Sometimes uh, people will say, gee, I like Deacon Randy's Mass better than you know, <laughs> Father so-and-so because it's quicker or whatever. But... Uh, right. Uh, there are certain elements uh, that a Mass contains, primarily consecration of the Eucharist, that uh, deacons cannot do. Can you uh, marry people? Yeah, I married my wife. Well, <laughs> sure. Uh, um, deacon, and... Deacons can be married at the time they are ordained. They cannot get married after ordination. But can you witness another and, couple's marriage? Right. So the sacraments that we can do, we are regular ministers of the Eucharist, which means we don't have to be um, delegated as an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist, which lay people are. Mm -hmm. But we can do the sacraments of baptism uh, and marriage. Uh, shortly after I was ordained, a friend of mine said, well, can you hear my confession? And I said, certainly. Uh, but we can't give you absolution and I'm not bound by the seal of confession, so I can tell everybody what your sins were. <laughs> we also cannot do the sacrament of anointing of the sick because that sacrament does involve forgiveness of sins. Sure. So again, um, that forgiveness of sins and those two sacraments of healing, we're not permitted to do that. We also can't uh, confirm um, or uh, ordained. So you, the, the you two sacraments we really can do are baptism and marriage. And you can't ordain other deacons to kind of self-propagate the ministry? No. Uh, only bishops do that, right? Only bishops can uh, ordain. Only bishops can confirm uh, other than special permission that a priest can do. So recently during the pandemic, for example, Archbishop uh, Hebda delegated all the priests to do confirmations in their local parish. Uh, if somebody is being received into the church uh, through the RCAA process, the local priest can also sure. confirm at that point. But otherwise, regular confirmation is reserved to the bishop. And the sacrament really is a sacrament of service. So we are to be an example in the, the world of what it means to be of service. Hmm. In fact, here in the archdiocese, most deacons are assigned uh, two assignments, one in parish ministry, 
and one in service. Now, I am not <clears throat> assigned any particular uh, service um, through a formal process, but uh, service is one of the areas that Father Paul asked me to get involved with, so that's why I work with the Social Justice Committee. Mm -hmm. The Stewardship Council uh, head up our food drives and our food packing and some of the other um, outreach types of ministries that we do here in, at St. Catherine Drexel. Sure. And this is a curious thing for me and maybe for some of our people who are watching and listening. How did you get to become a deacon? I mean, what was it that was seen in you that, you know, somebody pointed out, that guy, make him a deacon? How did that happen? Mine was um, God basically hitting me over the head to get my attention. Um, I had been working on a, a congressional campaign as a finance director, and when we lost by 121 votes in 1986, I kind of went through a period uh, thinking I was going to be working in a mobile congressional district office, and what, what do I do next? And being unemployed there for a little stretch, I was able to do some things at Holy Rosary School where my children and all had attended. And we had the sixth grade taking a field trip to Fargo-Moorhead. So I volunteered to help chaperone that. One of the other chaperones had a newspaper that they were reading, uh, finished reading it and passed it off to me and just kind of skimmed through it. And all of a sudden I saw an article that talked about the diaconate, which I knew very little about at the time read the article, and, oh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what that's all about. The first stop we were going to make was at St. Francis in Moorhead, where Father Mike Sullivan, who was a good friend of mine, uh, originally from Detroit Lakes. In fact, I'd been his supervisor before he went in the seminary. And uh, subsequently, my last paid employment was at St. Joseph the Worker in Maple Grove, where he is currently the pastor. So it went from me being his supervisor to uh, uh, him being my supervisor. But I said to myself, when we get to St. Francis, and I see uh, Mike, I'm going to ask him if he knows if there's anything going on in Crooks and Diocese for the diaconate. And uh, walked in the front door of St. Francis, and right away, Mike's coming around the corner. So we just stopped and chit-chatted for a bit, and then said, oh, by the way, do you know, has Crooks and got anything going as far as a diaconate program? I just got something in the mail this morning. And he pulled out uh, something that uh, one of the priests had been asked to put together, uh, basically a formation program to get the diaconate started. Uh, so it was a combination of that article that I just happened to, to run across, uh, sparking my interest, and then the conversation with Father Mike that uh, really opened the door to taking a serious look at it. I met with our uh, pastor back at Holy Rosary and... Um, he had gotten that same mailing and uh, encouraged me to take a look at it. So I was actually part of the first uh, diaconate formation program that the Crooks and Diocese had mm -hmm. offered. The diaconate is uh, an ancient ministry. It goes back to the early days of the church. And, you know, Todd, you, you talked about getting married. Um, the, the letter of James talks about the office of bishop and the office of deacon. So it's pretty much the same things about both of them, and that, uh, that they are to be married once. It um, doesn't say anything about the presbyterate, about priests, but um, deacons, that's been interpreted that, again, as I said, if we are married at the time we're ordained, we, of course, can stay married, but if something happens to our wife, we cannot get married uh, a second time without special permission of the Vatican, which is rarely granted. It's uh, been granted in a few instances where uh, a younger deacon has young children and um, mm -hmm. uh, feel that there's uh, a need there. The, there's really two parts of the diaconate. One is the permanent deacons, which is what I am, and we're ordained into... Uh, serve as deacons, and that's going to be our full ministry. The other diaconate is transitional deacons, which uh, seminarians generally are ordained as a deacon as they're a, a transitional deacon as they're approaching their last year of the seminary and serve in a parish doing exactly the same things that permanent deacons do, but just to get a sense of what it's really like to work in a parish. Um, and then they are ordained to the priesthood. So 
the, the sacrament of holy orders really has three components to it. One is to the diaconate, one is to the presbyterate or priesthood, and the uh, full ordination uh, is to, to the bishops. But our ministry um, really uh, involves service to whatever God happens to be calling us to, um, and that can vary from day to day. Sure. The uh, Bible basis for the deacon is Acts 6, isn't it? Where That's generally where we look at the uh, beginning of the diaconate. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some scripture scholars who differ with that opinion. Uh -huh. um, and um, just like all, all of scripture, there's interpretations and uh, scholars that say that this is what it means, this is what happened, and other ones that say, no, it's something different. But that's kind of the root of the whole service Correct. element, that yep. the deacons were appointed to help people in need and, and all of that, so the apostles could kind of do their thing. Good, good. Yep. Um, what about your own prayer life and spiritual life? Um, how how does being a deacon influence that? Do you do you go off on priest retreats? Do you have deacon retreats? Uh, do you have your own practices that help nourish your life as a deacon? Well, anyone who's ordained um, is required to pray the liturgy of the hours um, at a minimum, doing morning prayer and evening prayer, mm -hmm. um, which is basically a, a couple psalms included in each and then a, either an Old Testament reading with the uh, morning prayer or New Testament with the evening prayer, uh, a few other prayers that are, are part of that. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually uh, office of reading, there's mid-morning, noontime, uh, mid-afternoon, night prayer that are parts of that, but the parts that we're all required to, to do is morning prayer and evening prayer. So a lot of resources to help keep you in the spiritual life and grounded while you're serving and being in the world. Right. And we're also encouraged to have a spiritual director, hmm. uh, and um, we are supposed to do uh, an annual retreat. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I was ordained for the Diocese of Crookston, and even though I had the permission of the Crookston Bishop to uh, serve in the Archdiocese and permission of the uh, Archbishop here uh, to be given full faculties to serve here, mm -hmm. um, I still do my uh, retreats with the Crookston Diocese, which has been kind of uh, interesting. They do them at uh, Buffalo, uh, mm -hmm. which for me is about a 25-minute drive. For the uh, deacons from Crookston, it's uh, anywhere from a three to a six-hour drive. Right. Um, but that's in the process of being changed because the diocese is uh, acquiring the Benedictine Sisters uh, Monastery, and we'll be moving the, the offices there. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I've heard is the deacon retreats will also take place there. So I'll be going to Crookston from now on instead of Buffalo. Um, but uh, the retreats, the spiritual direction, the assigned morning and evening prayer are the uh, components that are really basically required. But in addition to that, our own reading of scripture, our own mm -hmm. uh, personal prayer life, uh, spiritual reading, uh, we're encouraged to do that. We're also supposed to be doing continuing education. So in addition to the required courses we took during formation, we're supposed to be uh, continuing to, to grow in our knowledge of scripture and theology and service. Mm -hmm. um, I know you mentioned near the beginning your role at Mass, but could you walk us through what a Sunday morning at St. Catherine Drexel would be like for you? Like when you get here, how you prepare, what do you do, and then how the day finishes off for you? Well, it depends upon if I am... Um, serving as a deacon for the Mass or serving as a deacon and also giving the homily. Oh, so um, you can do homilies too? Correct. Okay. Um, now, interestingly, in the Crookston Diocese, Bishop Balky, who was the bishop at the time I was ordained, did not grant uh, faculties for uh, homilies to all the deacons when they were ordained. He actually gave me that faculty a year before ordination because I was working on a master's degree at St. John's at the time. Mm -hmm. And he had asked me to uh, give homilies at least once a month at Holy Rosary. So it's uh, uh, very rare for somebody who is not already ordained. In fact, it's not even technically allowed. Right. Uh, but uh, 
Bishop Balky made a lot of exceptions in my case. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but generally, I try to arrive about an hour before Mass. Uh, there's not a lot of actual preparation I need to do, so it's more uh, just getting myself mentally and spiritually ready for the Mass mm -hmm. and uh, greeting people because it's, uh, again, we're to be uh, service and we try to be a welcoming community here and try to stay close to the front door and greet people as they come in. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes I get involved in a lengthy discussion uh, or conversation with somebody, so a lot of people just end up passing me by, and I still try to wave at them or say hi or something. But um, And again, at Mass itself, it's assisting the priest. Um, the deacon always proclaims the gospel, no matter who the celebrant is, even if it's the Pope. Uh, so if you went to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and... They were short a deacon, and the master ceremonies or something came out and looked over the crowd. You could get to read the gospel before Pope Francis preached on it. Correct. Wow. That's excellent. Yeah. And that has happened a few different times when You've we've been on, been, been on vacation someplace, and uh, the priest will just come out and ask, is there any deacons present today? And uh, but That's never happened in Rome. Um. I've deaconed in Rome, including at St. Peter's, but Ooh. it was as uh, part of a group that we were traveling okay. with. Yeah, that's good. Wow. So you read the gospel, and you also read the prayers of the faithful, right? Correct. Okay. And we do, there are certain parts uh, that we do, so the penitential rite, uh, the deacon does that, and the uh, invitation to the sign of peace. Um, which has been kind of interesting during the pandemic because depending upon where I'm serving here at Holy Rosary, we, I mean, St. <laughs> Catherine the Drexel, St. Catherine Drexel, we uh, invite people to share, but do it whatever level they're comfortable. So sure. with family members, they may still shake hands or hug, but other people, they just wave or give some type of a, a signal. Mm -hmm. um, when I've deaconed back in my home uh, parish in the La Crosse Diocese in Wisconsin, they are not even doing any invitation to the sign of peace. So again, that varies from diocese to diocese, but normally uh, that invitation to share the sign of peace is part of ours. And then the sending forth. Sure. Um, so um, sending people, uh, you know, the mass has ended, you know, go in peace. I modify that. I always try to add something that uh, relates back to the readings. So it's, you know, because it used to be that we would process out with a lectionary, mm -hmm. and then that changed. It's like, no, the word goes out in you. So that's why I try to you know, oh. send them forth with a reinforcing what that message in the readings was. Sure. So this weekend, for example, Jesus is embracing children. So you could say, go in peace and hug a child today or something or like go, that. Or go in peace and act like a child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, do you have any, any last words of... Um, you know, message or even an encouragement for anybody out there who might be thinking, hmm, maybe I want to be a deacon. Do we need, well, more, do we need more deacons these days? or are we Well, we need more deacons. We need more priests. And it um, happens in a number of different ways. Uh, sometimes it's um, you see somebody that they would make a good priest or they would make a good deacon, and you just invite them to uh, be open to it and to pray mm -hmm. about it. Um, so uh, that's one thing that can happen. Otherwise, if you're just feeling that calling on your own, uh, I would encourage somebody, you know, either talk to Father Paul if they're thinking of the priesthood or talk to myself if they're thinking about the diaconate um, and just kind of get a sense for what it is. The current requirement in the uh, United States for all diaconate formation programs is a year of discernment where it's really mm -hmm. – an opportunity to take a closer look at what is the diaconate, mm -hmm. what's involved in it, um, and see if that really is what you're being uh, sure. called to. So do you think that somebody would get involved in some service ministry or start praying as a deacon would and just to kind of try it on and see if it fits? Or it's just like mine was kind of a, a knock in the head by God. It's uh -huh. whatever... God needs to do to get through to you sure. and, and see what you're being called to. It's interesting, <clears throat> back at Holy Rosary, we were part of the Renew program and then uh, Beyond Renew, mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, so the small groups we had for Renew, some of them didn't want to continue, so we kind of merged a few groups together. We, my wife Nancy and I were in a group of um, uh, five couples in that Beyond Renew, and three of us in that group became deacons. Wow, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. Any last words for our friends out there? Just like anything, you need to be open to what God's calling you to do. Recognize what your gifts are and realize those gifts are are not mine. They're not yours. Those gifts are for everybody and share those gifts in whatever direction God is calling you. Take a step, take a risk, and go ahead and do it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, this is a production of the Catholic Church of St. Catherine Drexel. This is Kate's podcast. We invite you to contact us, uh, comment on this, um, let us know what you think. And if you've got other topics you'd like us to address, or if there are other people that you might be interested in having us chat with. Blessings on your day. And if you're inclined or if God is hitting you over the head, go out there and be a deacon. 